This is Pat Solver with The Doctor Weighs In, and I'm at Stanford's MedEx, which has been described as the iconic academic medicine conference globally. And I have with me today uh, an old friend and somebody who I trained with. Uh, we decided it was quite a while ago at UCSF. <laughs> and he just gave the most spectacular keynote talking about democratizing medicine. So Eric, what do you mean when you talk about democratizing medicine? What, what's that all about? Well, the term, as you know, Pat, refers to having medicine available to all. And that has many different layers. The most important one is getting rid of the information asymmetry, changing the control levers, so that each person with the new tools that we have today takes a charge and ownership of their data and ownership of their health. Well, you said in uh, your talk, and this really struck me, that it's your civil right to have your medical data. Uh, and yet, um, I think you said something like, 48 states or some huge number of states, the data actually belongs either to the hospital or the doctor. What can we do to change that? Well, we do need some pretty drastic change. It's 49 states, uh, except for New Hampshire, where the data are owned legally by doctors and or hospitals. That has to get fixed. We can't democratize medicine unless people, it should be their entitlement, not just access their information. That is not enough, Pat. We have to have it that they own it, and they are the ones that grant rights to sharing that with doctors and hospitals. It needs to be flipped. Everything in medicine needs to have uh, a great inversion, which is going to happen because once you digitize things, you set this whole thing up. This is an inevitable path. Once you've got portable information and it's rich information, high-definition human beings, this is the next phase. Well, you know, it's very interesting because you and I trained in the days when we owned the knowledge and we owned the data and we thought we owned the patient. We pretty much owned everything. We even set up a system where they had to come to us. Um, how do you think healthcare is going to look in the next, let's say, five to ten years when we've been successful at doing some of the things that you talked about in terms of democratizing medicine? How is it going to be delivered? What's it going to look like? Well, it's going to take a while, and then, you know, maybe five years will start to see it take hold. But realistically, this needs to happen, but like everything else in medicine, it takes much longer than it should. And it won't happen from within the medical community. Uh, that's like asking the stagecoach drivers to build the railways. It's just not going to happen that way, Pat. As or the you know. coal companies to quit producing coal. Yeah, it's just, it has to happen from the outside. It could happen from a consumer-led uh, movement. It could happen from large employers who say, we can't go with this old system. We need a new medicine, which really emphasizes, um, we talk a lot about patient-centered. That isn't even the beginning of what this is about, um, really. So there ha this shift is going to take a while because there's a lot of resistance. And, you know, when we were trained, we grew up in the era of ingrained paternalism which has been around for more than a couple of millennia. And so to change that, it takes a little time, unfortunately. I get that. But now we have a lot of tools where patients can actually do a lot of things themselves that they used to have to depend on uh, health care for uh, on uh, coming to us. Um, do you think you, you could see an, uh, any time when we would actually go from, and we'll close with this, from democratizing to do-it-yourself? Well, I do believe that uh, you're touching on one of the critical factors, as I talked about today and in the patient will see you now. The tools of being able to do your own diagnosis and monitoring, where you then go to the doctor and say, here's my data, you know, what do you think? And the doctor says, you know, uh, not only has oversight, but gives you wisdom and guidance and and counsel. That's where we're headed. So it's not truly do it yourself, but part of it is doctorless, part of it. And that's because you got the tools to acquire data. It would be lab tests, it could be physical exam components, it could be sensors, and you have machine learning in the context of your real world to interpret that data. But you still need treatment, you still need oversight, you need that human to human factor, which is so essential. And um, finally, so do you think doctors are going to be able to make this transition. It's going to require a whole new way of 
picking people to get into me- who get into medical school and training people who get into medical school. Um, from the doctor point of view, what, what what's going to happen to the profession? Well, I do think actually doctors at this moment in time, it may be considered a peak of disillusionment. And so I think this is actually a very formidable improvement because it decompresses the workload. It shifts a lot of responsibility and charge to patients. So if we were willing to embrace this change, this could be our best way out because otherwise we're saddled with just a ridiculous amount of uh, of responsibilities that really should be um, handed off and that patients and their families can take a lot more charge. And they want that if we let them have it. And I hope that that's going to be the case. But it will take a while because I think you're well aware there's quite a bit of resistance to this concept. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Um, it was a very interesting talk, and I uh, really look forward to watching you as you go forward, I hope, helping to lead the charge for, these, uh, for this transformation in medicine. Thank cool. you. Thank you, Pat. Great to visit with you again.